And I guess this is the, um, we touched on this earlier about um, tidying up rubble. So this is literally, obviously demolition waste from our local area. I buy this from a mile away. Uh, but if we put that in a pile along there, it would look pretty poor. Mm. If you just package it in a gabion, which is a, a pretty relatively low energy, there's not a lot of steel involved in these, in these cages. Mm -hmm. um, and you're, to, you're also talking about a 60 year lifespan on these things, aren't you? And, yeah. and again, that's, that's, a, that's a subject that we haven't quite touched on, which again is another quite big deal, I think, is the, this whole thing about sustainability and, and, and carbon is totally dependent really on well, not totally dependent, but one of the big factors of it is the fact of how long this stuff lasts, isn't it? So if we're replacing exactly. stuff, that's a lot of carbon, mm -hmm. isn't it? Retrofitting is a lot of carbon. Mm -hmm. If we've got to make sure that what we do at the start is something that's actually going to last. Yeah. You know, these things are going to last 60 years, finish. They're an incredibly important habitat for, uh, for spiders, especially. Great place for things to warm up on and quite a nice piece of infrastructure to give you an edge to something, you know, That's way it. better than a standard. And, and if people are doing things like this at home, you can use such a range of materials. You know, I've seen some with old broken plant pots filled yeah, up, and stacked anything. up, tiles, all sorts of things. Yeah. And again, that creates a very different habitat within, within yes, this. Yes, of course. So, of course. you know, you yeah. can get such yeah. a range of things even yeah. within this and a bit well, of artwork. We, <clears throat> we use sheep's wool in, in, on our um, cycle shelters. We, we, we put small gabions up full of sheep's wool and then the birds use that to nest, pull mm. out to nest with. So there's all sorts of things. Essentially, gabions are just a good way of packaging material, aren't they? Yeah. A really useful way of packaging material. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, I'm really hoping. We haven't got any uh, common lizards here. I'm really hoping one day I'm going <laughs> to see a common lizard on top of this thing. I always think of it as a, like a, it feels to me like an, an Essex dry stone wall, that does. <laughs> you know, it's like a dry stone wall without the effort. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I'm going to have to stand in the shade a bit, I think, if we can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can, can get in this. Do you want to talk about the wall later? Yeah. Then? This well, is no, look, we can talk about it now. It's just I might have to find shade if there is. Yeah, or you can, or we can have a bit of a chat and I'll run away and then run back. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> just I'm going to get burnt otherwise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Didn't realize it'd be so sunny today. So, uh, so what, oh, we, what we've done on this post is essentially use bamboo for the bigger holes and then yeah. we've just drilled the smaller holes on the post. So then you get the both again. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what we were talking about as the acoustic wall. So I've, we're building my son a, a sound studio behind here and we thought, mm -hmm. well, well, why don't we mess around with a, an acoustic wall that might, um, uh, you know, help to uh, uh, mediate the sound a bit. So this is a, a, an eight inch wide fence, essentially just eight inch posts. Um, again, with the perforated steel that we talked about earlier, just fixed to it uh, and then packed with sand. Mm -hmm. So again, the bees nest in through the holes in, in, in the perforated steel and, and that mass of sand is an incredibly good acoustic barrier. So that, you know, I'm not saying you, 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 you know, you replace the whole of the acoustic fencing with that, but if you just add a few panels of those in, oh, you yeah. have some potential for habitat. And of course, plants grow very well on top of it as well. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So you've got all those elements going on on what would be a sterile place normally. Yeah, definitely. Um, no, it makes so much sense. And, it, and as we said, it adds so much interest, you know, yeah. again, you know, having a more diverse landscape, a bit yeah. of a change of material is, yeah. is really interesting. Yeah. And I mean, we've, you, we've got quite a lot going on here. So we've got obviously gabions, we've got acoustic wall, we've got buried logs, we've got topography change, which is the other big thing. So if possible, don't rake everything flat. If possible, get some topography in, in, mm -hmm. the, in the substrate, because then you get damper areas, drier areas, and you get that lovely variation, which is, mm -hmm. is good for uh, uh, diversity. And again, this is, this is uh, construction waste on top of soil. So you can see way too much growth. The first couple of years, I was very excited about this. Now I'm less excited. I mean, obviously this year has been, it's made things a lot more intense because of the rainfall. Mm. But um, I'm gonna be interested to see what happens to this next year if we have a drier year, just to see yeah. how it performs. But you can see that, that there's no way this amount of growth would be happening just in the construction waste so that mm -hmm. must be picking up from the area from the soil underneath um but again like we said there's potential for that to be good and bad you know i mean yeah. it, 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 you know it's uh, this area is slightly different because we scraped off more of the topsoil uh, and then we and we've got slightly more depth of construction waste on here so you can see there's a much lovelier more open uh and more diverse space and very much lower maintenance mm -hmm. so i haven't got to do much with this and you can see it's absolutely cr crawling with um, invertebrates and bees. Yeah, um, it really is. It's amazing to see so many. 
But again, I think that's because you've got the you've got a good mix of not only the wildflowers but also the habitat. Because if yeah. you didn't have that, they'd have to be travelling a much greater distance yeah. and all that type yeah. of thing. You wouldn't get colonies here, and you've probably got things coming from, as you said, you already know. Yeah, you've got I'd hope coming so. From miles You'd hope away. so, wouldn't you? Yeah. And I guess the other thing is that open mosaic habitat, which is a, this is a is an incredibly diverse habitat is really underplayed in landscape, I think, mm. isn't it? You know what I mean? We don't actually design it in very much, do we? It's no. one of those landscapes that's got, or one of those natural features that's got missed, I'd say, a bit within the landscape industry. So designing open mosaic back into a landscape, it, you know, it doesn't have to be all like this, but certainly pockets of this within a scheme would be really cool to do. Definitely. Right? Well, I think this is one of the things that's come up a lot on this podcast generally, is that we need a better mosaic across the landscape right. because actually you know so many things are so sterile we were talking earlier about actually you gave a great example of a car park and a agricultural field the comparison of the two yeah 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 well i mean uh, you know there's been a lot of research done into to <laughs> and it turns out that a, a piece of infrastructure even like a standard uh, multi-story car park has more invertebrate activity than the center of a farm in arable field and uh, you know it, when you hear it like that, it's quite astonishing. But that's mm. obviously true because there's no structure, there's no niches, is there? There's no, no breeding exactly. space. It's all often sprayed as well, which obviously uh, doesn't help. Exactly. So you know, it's, you know, it's it's a multi-story big... car park is probably less less herbicide, yeah. and less uh, pesticide for sure. That's it. Um, probably disturbed less. Yeah. Away. Yeah, you know, yeah. And way more, just way more sort of little places for things yeah. to get. And I think uh, the structural elements, like we've said earlier, are vital. There's no mm. way this landscape would be anywhere near as good without this variety of structure. If it was just flowers, fine, looks pretty and all that, but it's nowhere near as good for wildlife. Uh, and obviously the structure can extend up to a green roof, which obviously a lot of people know and is becoming, you know, I mean, pretty much in London now is a, is a, is a, pretty much a standard. default standard now. Yeah. But there's green roofs and there's green roofs, as we all know, and uh, structure on a green roof is a really important thing. And that's been underplayed again. So there's no reason why you can't have log piles, gabions, sand piles all that should be on a roof as well as some plants yeah a bit of undulating landscape Absolutely. as well you don't want it just flat no and you yeah. can you can load parts of the roof uh thicker where the the supporting columns are underneath so you can get round the loading issue often by just mm. putting the material where the where the supporting columns are uh, and also most green roofs this year is a really an exception so if you're going to look at a green roof this is the year to look at one because there's never been a year like this i mean that roof up there for instance it, you know, it's never going to be as green as that in July, in, in August um, normally. So most green roofs will brown off, in the, in yeah. the, obviously. Um, so the structural elements are actually going to give it that element of interest as well yeah. from an aesthetic point of view. So that you can make the structure actually work when the plants die or yeah. when the plants, you know, uh, brown off. So, so we, we actually went to look at a green roof with Dusty, Dusty yeah. Gedge. We've done an episode with him on green roofs. But we went just before we had all the wet weather. Okay. So it had all been quite dry and it had all been overtaken with chives and all that type yeah, of thing. Well, yeah, they managed yeah, to sort yeah, of survive yeah, that dry yeah, weather. Yeah. But it's interesting because you see that it is a, you know, there's a mosaic of plants there. And obviously those plants respond very differently. So mm. you get that change in species as well, depending yeah. on weather. Yeah, you so do. So you do get, yeah. and, and, and that adds quite, interest as well. You know? Yeah, yeah, you do. But if you, if you get that variation in soil depth on a green roof, then you've got you'll get that more of a variation of plants, mm. obviously. If you just have a single depth, which is what most green roofs are like, obviously, yeah. then if that one particular plant is going to die at that stress level, it's going to die all over the roof, isn't it? Exactly, because the, yeah. the, the soil's the same. Yeah. You know? There's no resilience to no. it. No. Yeah. Um, so no, yeah, this is, the, this is the year for green roofs for sure, <laughs> for sure. Um, so just to talk about maybe the, the, the substrates slightly. So this area here, so in front of this bench, this area in this space is all crushed That's concrete, right. pure yeah. crushed concrete. And you can see we, we, we put some wild thyme in here. Mm -hmm. And um, wild thyme, as you probably know, there's no way it's going to be able to survive out there in, with, that element, with that level of competition because it generally only survives when rabbits are keeping everything down on chalk downland. Mm -hmm. um, but if you, if you give it the stress of pure crushed concrete, you eliminate quite a few of the other plants from the equation. So therefore the thyme can really, and thyme absolutely, you can see, it grows like crazy in crushed concrete. Because mm -hmm. essentially that's chalk, isn't it? You yeah. know, so um, we're giving it what it wants, aren't we? And we're also saying we don't want things to grow tall here because there's a bench here. We want yeah. it to grow low. So we've designed in that element mm -hmm. by the substrate, haven't we? Yeah. Um, it makes so much sense when you think about it, but it's not something you'd ever necessarily think of really. No, yeah. no, and, 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 and it also, the other thing I think it does is like using very low fertility substrates like crushed concrete, it, it allows you to design in space between your plants. So if you want to open the vegetation up and give some space, 
you can say, right, I'm going to have a reel of crushed concrete running through the centre, that's going to give me that permanent open mm -hmm. space. And that's quite a nice design element to have, isn't it? Otherwise, it is, yeah. you've got to garden that in, haven't you? Exactly. You know what I mean? You can only make these things happen by gardening normally, mm -hmm. whereas you can make them happen by the soil. You know? I said, well, it's a, sm it's a smart way of gardening, really, isn't it? It's a, well, foresight, I would say. A foresight in how you plan things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which can save you so much time and energy. And of course, you can get a lot of this done when, uh, at the construction phase. Yeah. That's the other thing. So you can utilize your construction digger drivers and, and they don't have to know a lot about plants. Uh, they just, you know, we, you can just get them to use the materials they're using for construction mm -hmm. into the landscape at that point in time, which is going to be a money saver. Oh, imagine. yeah. Well, there's so many problems and costs associated with taking stuff away. Yeah. You know, using stuff on site is, you know, everyone's interested in that now. Yeah, but yeah. it's how you do it. And this is what we were talking about earlier as well, is there's, there's such a challenge around how you design these things because the big problem we have as designers is often we don't have the time to necessarily figure all of these things yeah. out and it's how do we where do we go to get this information how readily available is this yeah. information and how yeah. we can help promote it to other people yeah. you know, it's a big it's a big challenge yeah, especially as you know there's not been a lot of research in some of these areas no. No. so it's you know it's a huge opportunity for clients and designers to mm. really improve the environment save carbon in lots of innovative Absolutely. ways and save money as well. It does, on maintenance it does as they say, tick yeah. every box. It so. does, it, it really does, does pretty yeah. much.